Well, brethren and sisters, we talked about that delegation that came from Bethel in chapter 7 of Zechariah down to Jerusalem to inquire as to whether they should continue or not in their fathers of mourning and weeping over the destruction of Jerusalem. And you will remember that they got the astonishing reply from Yahweh that he was not aware, of course he was aware they were doing it, but he was not aware that they were doing it to him. And that was, a, you imagine, you can't imagine the impact of that upon anybody. The fact that for 70 odd years you've done something and God says, really? And that would have set them back somewhat. Then he told them what he thought about their fast and it was nothing else but an indulgence in self-pity and congratulations that they fast twice a week. You know, the, the Pharisee in Luke 18, I do this and I do that and I go without and I punish my body and so forth. I'm a wonderful person. And it was just an orgy of, of self-pity and grand, a grandiose virtue that they thought they were practising. And God said, nothing of the sort. And he went on to tell them, didn't he, brothers and sisters, that if they'd thought about it, the reason they were fasting was their own fault, because they'd have never been in that situation had they obeyed his law. They wouldn't have gone into captivity. They wouldn't have had the, the agony of, of the captivity in Babylon and all that that meant. It was their own fault. So if you're going to be mourning something, you, you, you want to get your right reasons. And of course, the answer to the problem was cease to do the wrong thing. Do the right thing. And that will, that will be your own answer. And that, of course, comes at the end of chapter 8, because chapter 8 spills over, of course, into this particular question. And uh, you would, of course, gone home a bit depressed, I think, last time, because it's a pretty negative chapter and it was pretty challenging, brothers and sisters, as to our own motive. But tonight's different. Tonight, Yahweh's going to tell them what he's going to do. And Zechariah is a very, very powerful and positive chapter about the glory of the future age, brothers and sisters. What he will do, not what they will do, but what God will do. And they can join in, he says at the end, when they finally get their answer to their question, and he had to wait till the end of chapter 8 to get the answer, you can join in with that when you, when you join in with what I'm doing, he said, not what you're doing. And he is going to change the face of the globe. And it's a wonderful change, brothers and sisters. It really is. And when I thought about that, you know, and looking at those positive things, you know, your heart yearns for that age. And Brother Mike, you, in your opening prayer, he really, I think, echoed a very deep spirit in my heart, at any rate, brothers and sisters, at the moment. How long? How long before these things we're going to consider this evening will be a reality? Just how long is it going to be? And so what we're going to do, just to introduce tonight, is to, to talk a little bit about that. Just a, a little bit of current affairs, because we're going to learn about the Jerusalem being a city of truth, boys and girls playing in the streets, old men and old women without fear, of course, mingling with the population and so forth, the world pouring into Jerusalem, Jewish people being hosts, now, despite, now, now uh, of course, uh, looked upon as, as honourable people and not despised. We're going to see all of that. And, and when you look at that be? And when you look at these references up here, brothers and sisters, a combination of three of them. Oh, Yahweh, long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah. My soul is sore vexed, but thou, O Yahweh, how long? We see not our signs, there is no more any prophet, neither is there any among us that knoweth how long. O oh God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? Me, you, you understand your faults. We, we've all got our weaknesses and our secret sins which we're ashamed of and we pray for forgiveness and all of those things. But I think we've got this in common. I certainly have got this in me anyway. I got that what Ezekiel says in his ninth chapter. You sigh and you cry. All the abominations that are done in this world. Unspeakable things that are going on now that is not really proper for me even to mention from this platform. It would be offensive to some people. And yet it's everyday talk. It's not talked about as we're going to condone evil. No, no, it's no longer evil. It is the honourable thing to do. And you groan within yourself and you think, how long can he allow that to go on? And you think of your own faults and you think, well, who am I to condemn anybody? But 
We have this consolation, brothers and sisters, that even though we might do wrong and think wrong things, we hate ourselves for it, don't we? We hate ourselves for it. We, we grieve over that and it depresses us, but it doesn't depress the world. They're putting these things on picture shows now and won the award of the world. Explicit pictures about dreadful things. They're absolutely proud of it. And you think, oh, how long can that go on? And you read verses like that. We haven't got a prophet. We haven't got an angel. But brothers and sisters, you see that? We can't say that. We can't say that today. We just cannot say we see not our signs. Because they're so obvious, you'd have to be blind not to see them. And what, however the outcome may be, and no one knows exactly the outcome, the world is building up, brothers and sisters, for an absolute catastrophe. The whole thing is going to explode in bloodshed and violence and hatred and evil. There's nothing more prominent than that. So we cannot say today we don't see our signs. Now look at this one. Now don't believe all you're told about that. There's been a couple of superb articles in the papers recently, in the advertiser even, about this, that really saw what the issue really was. Now you see that map, brothers and sisters? Well, the one on the left-hand side, of course, shows the whole region there, from the west coast of Africa in Morocco, right across in through past I I uh, India, and then right down in Southeast Asia, just north of the border of Australia, is what is known as the Muslim Belt. And from the rim of the western rim of Africa right through to Indonesia, there are 1 1.2 billion Muslims. You know, ironically, there's 1.2 million Chinese and there's 1.2 million Catholics. Seems to be a popular figure, doesn't it? But of course, the Chinese are different, aren't they? We've got so many of them in this place, and we do love them. But these people are mad. These Muslims are crazy. Now, you notice that map's got different colours on it. You see the one in the big circle? Well, it's about the, the sectarian violence. You see, people are saying this. They're saying Bashar Assad, he, he's the, pre, the, the president of Syria. He's a brute. He's, he's, a, he, he's a mongrel. He's a dictator. He's cruel. He is all those things. And they say his opposition is the Freedom Army. That's a load of garbage. They're every bit as worse as he is. And if they get in control, brothers and sisters, it could even be worse still, believe me. And the stupid Western world cannot see that. Some can and some can't. And that is not about politics. With politics. It's got to do with religion, and it's a sectarian violence between the two divisions of the Muslim world. That's what it's all about. The whole, whole thing is about that. And day by day, the proof of that's becoming obvious. Now on that map, you've got the, the light pink and the dark one, the dark colour. And the dark colour is those is in, in majority. Now there are Sunnis and there are Shiites, okay? Who are they? Well, you see, it all happened way back in the 600s when Muhammad the the uh, irrevocable rule was that his successor, the caliph of the Muslim world, must be the very first in the bloodline of Muhammad, number one. Well, there was two of them. <laughs> they should have had a, you know, a test, I suppose, of their blood, but anyway. So there were two claimants to that throne. And that divided the Muslim world right after the death of Muhammad, way back in those years, as that says up there, over 1,300 years ago, that all happened. That's because of when this particular map was put out. That was the... About so 1,300 years ago, it all happened. And you see, where you see that dark colour is the only place where the, the Shiites are in a majority. And they are basically Iran and Iraq. They are where the Shiite majority is. The rest, from Morocco right across, they're not, they're not all Shiites, of course, there are Sunnis in, in with them, and there are Shiites scattered within the Sunnis. But we're talking about majorities. And where the majority is, is Iran and Iraq. 
and all the rest are majority. And now it's the Senators who are going, going to bring this, this, this great long fight over all those years to a climax. And that's what that, that fight is all about. And it's not only happening there. You just re heard this, this last week in Iraq, there were, there were about 60 bombings go on in the last couple of weeks. In the last couple of weeks, there's been about 700 people killed, all in areas where the Shiites are in majority. In Iraq, they're being attacked by the Sunnis. Now, you, you think about this. In Iraq, there are 60% of that population of Shiites. There are only 20% Sunni. The other 20 is made up of Kurds and other, other ethnic groups. But there's 60% Shiite in Iraq, 20% Shunni. Look to the east, to the right on the map, Iran, there's 98% Shiite. Now flash your eyes across over Iraq again and come to Saudi Arabia, there's 100% Sunni. So here is Iraq, or Iran rather, nearly all Shiite, Saudi Arabia all Shiite, and this one here has got 60% Shiite and 20% Sunni, and Iraq, Iran is supporting the, its own group, and, I, and Saudi Arabia is saying, you destroy, you try and destroy my minority, and look out. And they're confronting each other across that void. Now when we come to Syria, what do we find? Well, you see, in Syria... Mr. Assad, the Alawite, now that means that he's, a, he's a, of a minority sect which is related to the Shiite, so he's basically a Shiite. But he leads this group of people in, in Syria of whom the population is made up of just 17%. 17% Shiite. And 76% of that population is Sunni. And guess who the free army is pouring over the border? Sunnis. Now the other problem is that just if you move towards the west again from, from Syria, you've got Lebanon, haven't you? Which borders, of course, on the Mediterranean coast. Tiny strip of land there. And in there is Hezbollah. Who are they? Well, they're, of course, one of the, the terrorist groups of the, of the Arab world. But they're Shiite. And they're being attacked now by the Sunnis in, in Lebanon. Now, brothers and sisters, what does all this mean to us? What, is that, what does that mean? Well, it means this. That Yahweh says, and we read in Zechariah here, he says, I am jealous for Zion with a great jealousy. Now, the Shiites, the Sunnis, the Alawites have one thing in common, one thing only. They have it very much in common. They hate Israel. They hate Israel with a perfect hatred. That's the only thing they've got in common. And we're going to learn tonight that Yahweh is jealous against his, for his people's sake. He loves his people and he will not have them interfered with. And if ever those people got together, it would be dynamite for Israel. It really would. Israel's quite happy to stand on the sidelines and watch them beat each other to death. But if ever they got together, it would be a dreadful force to cope with. 1.2 billion 1.2 billion, not million, billion, versus 7 million. Think of that. Now, look at me. You've got green arrows, you've got blue arrows. So Iran, Iraq, Syria, and the Hezbollah in Lebanon are getting Russian support. Down in the south... USA has just moved 20,000, or tends to move 20,000 troops into Jordan. But that's a big concession by America, because America is against getting involved in any more foreign wars. But they want to get involved here, because they know that the stakes are worldwide here. Now, brothers and sisters, you think of this. This, this, this is enormous. Australia. This is between millions of people and it goes back for 1500 years 
that bitter hatred and enmity, and now it's spoiling over, boiling over into this open warfare right across the Middle East. And nothing's going to contain that. It's too big. It won't be contained. The only thing that's going to happen is that someone is going to control it. And I'm going to suggest that I don't, I don't know whether this will happen. This is a, just surmising, but it's a big possibility. If you were Russia in that situation, sitting around the table at the Kremlin, thinking what you could do uh, to your advantage to bring the Middle East under some sort of control that you could control it, what would you do? I think it's so logical you would sit down with the Sunnis and you'd sit down with the Shiites and you'd say, listen, we've all got one thing in common. We hate Israel. And Ezekiel says in the end that God will think an evil thought. And what is it? I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. In Yahweh's estimation, because of his jealousy for his people Israel, I don't know whether that's going to happen or happen that way or not. It may not happen that way, but that would be one way to bring those factions together, even if it's only temporary. Promise them the land with the rock. The third most holy place in the Muslim world, which is now trodden down by Jews. Promise them to get rid of the cursed Jews and give them back to that holy place where Muhammad left the earth with his steed and went up to heaven. What a prize to the Muslim world. What a prize that would be. And I believe that we could well and truly be on the eve of that evil thought. Now, please accept what I'm saying. I'm not saying that is the way it's going to happen. I don't know. But that is a possibility. Now, the other possibility is this. That's not the only place it's happening. What about that British soldier that got hacked to death in public and people watched it? And now you've got people lined up outside of Downing Street shouting at the government about that. What about Stockholm in Sweden, which has got the streets packed with people that are saying, we don't want these migrants in here. Get them out of this country, these Muslims. What about France, which this evening was a copycat thing in France when one of their soldiers got stabbed or tried to be stabbed to death. He only was wounded, uh, but the Muslims... And, and they had a video of this fellow, the Muslim, praying before he did it. The world is waking up at last that there's a mad people in this world. They are mad as mad. And they will do anything, brothers and sisters to gain their ends. And, you know, you could, you could write essays about these people. You could read the essays of, you know, people analysing their, their psyche. The Bible's got it perfectly, absolutely perfectly in a sentence about that long. When it described these people, every man's hand against his brother and every man's hand against every other man. That is exactly the description of these people. They are against everybody. And there's no way they're going to be placated. Because to them, to die for their cause is to go to heaven and there to be greeted by 72 virgins, the, the, the gift of Allah. And they believe it. They believe that with a fanaticism that's difficult to match even with sincerity of what we people who believe the truth. That is their conviction. And so that is what's facing us, brothers and sisters. And that can't go on. It's, it's, it's growing and growing and growing everywhere. And people are just going to get to the point where it will become intolerable to have these people in your, own, in your own environment. There are five million of them in France. And they buy up suburbs and put a sign at the end of the suburb when it's full, full of Muslims in, in, in the country, in France... In France's own country, there's a sign that says, no go area, Muslims only. In your country. Who's going to put up with that? And the day will come, and I think it's not far off, when a few mosques will go up and smoke. And that will be a torch that will be lit all over the world. How long, oh Yahweh? How long? You know, brothers and sisters, as I said, we, ha we haven't got angels, we haven't got a prophet. We've got our signs. And it's one thing we can say with utmost confidence that whatever they throw at Israel, 
whether it be 1.2 billion Arabs allied to the rest of Europe and Russia, who cares? One thing we can say with absolute confidence, they will never, ever, 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 ever destroy Israel. And when Israel's on its last legs, Deuteronomy says that, when their strength is all gone, two-thirds of the people killed in Jerusalem, Jerusalem reduced to rubble, and Russia's about to issue the coup de grace and to finish that nation once and forever, then he will come. He will come, brothers and sisters, and we will see him. And our hopes and aspirations will be fulfilled. And we will actually stand on this earth with Jesus Christ our Lord. It's an incredible thought. That's what Zechariah aches about. It's an exciting book, brothers and sisters. And Zechariah 8 is full of those positive things that are going to happen when our Lord comes. Now, it says in the divisions of the chapter, this is one way that Yahweh will affect remarkable change, possible things to contemplate. You things that you think entirely in those situations impossible, but he do it. From verses nine to fifteen, they'll be encouraging to continue our labours in in the current times. By the way, I've got copies of all these. Oh, sorry, Manny, I forgot to bring them, but I'll give them to you this week sometime. So he'll have copies of this for anybody who wants to get them later on. So 9 to 15, encouragement to continue our labours in the current times. Verses His ultimate answer to their question, the question of whether they should fast or not, the answers in their own actions, obedience, will see the change from mournful feasts to feasts of joy and lasting happiness. That's the answer. 20 to 23, instead of being despised and oppressed by other nations, those nations will now seek for the Jews to lead them to their God. I want to talk a lot about that. I, I want to talk when we, we won't get there tonight, anywhere near it. Uh, I don't intend to try that. But when we do get to that section, brothers and sisters, I just want to describe to you in simple terms the sheer brilliance of that scheme. When you, when you think about that and the whole of the scripture, the whole of the purpose of God, it is absolutely brilliant what God is going to do. And what's that going to achieve? I want to explain that to you. It's brilliant. It really is. And when our, our brother read it tonight, of course, you will have noticed the emphasis. Yahweh of armies. Yahweh, and Tim read that beautifully. Yahweh of armies. So what seems impossible to man will be performed by Yahweh of armies. Look at the times that appears in that chapter. And you mentioned the people listening to the prophet talking that they were living in, rubbing shoulders with the Samaritans. Every, life, every day was taking your life in your hands, danger to your children, danger to your wives and families, danger to everybody. And here's this fellow talking about peace and equity and happiness and boys and girls and old men and old women. And they just shake their heads in disbelief. And the prophet kept saying, Yahweh of Hermes! Yahweh of Hermes! And you know, brothers and sisters, I've got a pretty vivid imagination and I try to use that properly sometimes and I exercise that in my mind on the reality of that right me to death. Because I, I just think to myself, in your, in your human nature, this is your human nature talking, not, not your spirit of, that, that you have from the truth, it's your human nature. Your human nature says, oh, I can't believe that. But Yahweh of Rabbi says, I will do it, John. I will do that. Look at that ten times in that chapter. That's unprecedented in the scripture. Over and over again. You think I can't do it? You know who I am? I'm Yahweh of Arby's. And brothers and sisters, nothing is impossible with him. And that is what the prophet is going to tell them in those chapters. Now when you look at that chapter, look at verse 1. Again the word of Yahweh of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of armies, I was jealous for Zion. Now, that's not true. In the, that's not what it really says. All the reliable translations change that, brothers and sisters. He, it's not was, it's am. I am jealous for Zion. I am jealous for Zion. Now, we know there were two reasons for that jealousy. Uh, chapter 1, for example, you, you read here in, in, uh, in, in Zechariah chapter 1, in verse 14... One of the reasons why Yahweh is jealous 
In verse 14 of chapter 1 of Zechariah, he says, So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of armies, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I'm very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. So here's the jealousy of our God for the people that he's loved because others, others are coming into that situation and would try and take them away from him. And he's very furious about that. There's another reason, brothers and sisters. Because, you see, if he didn't love his people, he wouldn't care less, would he? You only care about your loved ones because you love them. If you didn't, you wouldn't care, would you? So, you see, jealousy is a cruel thing, uh, says the proverb, when it's exercised wrongfully. But there is a pure jealousy. Deuteronomy chapter 4, Yahweh says, I am a jealous ale. I'm very jealous. One of the reasons was that the nations are trying to take over his people. But you know, brothers and sisters, the greatest hurt that any lover can find is not about the fellow that comes and takes his wife. That's secondary to me. The big hurt, the big hurt, is the wife goes with him. That really hurts. And that hurts Yahweh. Show you something. In James chapter 1. Now there's some contention over the actual meaning of, the, of this verse. But I don't believe that it, it means exactly it says what it here. It's very sometimes difficult to, to ascertain that. But James chapter 4 rather it is. In chapter 4 he speaks about the, his relationship to us. And he, he says in verse 4 that uh, those who, who are, of course, un, are not practising the truth are adulterers and adulteresses. Now, that, you can only commit adultery if you marry. So the ecclesia is his bride. And, and, and when they do these things, it's spiritual adultery. And he, he says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? You're God's enemy. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, you see, you read that and you think, Oh, yeah, it's just telling us if we, if, if we obey the truth, it, it, it's all right. If, if we don't, well, we, God becomes our enemy. Brothers, he's talking about a marriage. He's talking about real deep feelings here. That we were baptised into his son. We became, prospectively, the, the bride of Christ. We're going to be his bride. Not a question of being either goodies or baddies. It's when you become baddies, it, 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 it is a violation of that marvellous covenant which he signed with his blood because he loved us. And that's the point that James is trying to get home to these people. Now, now look at verse 5. Now, th this is rather ambiguous, the way that it's put here. It says, Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Now, the way that's worded, it, it would seem to say that, you know, the spirit in us is a spirit of bias to sin. But there are a couple of other translations and there is a very good uh, basis for it, brothers and sisters, that change that completely. And I think the context is better understood this way, and I'll read it now from the RSV, and this is what it says. Or do you suppose it is in vain that the scripture says he yearns jealousy, jealously, over the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. So Yahweh has put into our hearts a spirit of truth, not the Holy Spirit, I'm talking about those sort of things, but an attitude. He's put into our hearts an attitude that, is, that has brought us close to the truth. We look at it, brothers and sisters, and we think what a marvellous thing it is. We study our Bibles. It makes a lot of sense. We see some marvellous things in it. Our heart just bursts in gratitude and we learn to love the God that wrote that and he put it there. He put that spirit there. We would never have that if we thought naturally. If we, we would never. The highest points of my life are at my desk. I, there's no higher point in my life than when I get to that desk and I get immersed in something like this and I, the spirit soars and you think, my, what a remarkable book this is. And you bow your head and you think, Thank you, God, for the love that he's shown. Well, that's the spirit he's put in us. Now, when we abandon that, he's jealous. 
He might be jealous against the nations for taking us away, but I believe he's more jealous if we abandon the truth that he's put in our hearts. That's what I think that verse is saying. He's very jealous if we turn away from that which he's put into our hearts. And I can understand that. And you can understand that. Because you, in in measure, we've all had our thrills in the Bible, brothers and sisters, if you haven't been able to do it for yourself, and that's no no shame because not everybody's endowed to do that. But if you've absorbed it from Brother Thomas, Brother Roberts, Brother Carter or whatever, Brother Purse or whatever, if you've absorbed it, brothers and sisters, and it thrills you and it ties you to your God in a deep reverential love, then he's very jealous if that waxes and wanes. So you see, he's jealous for Zion with a great jealousy. Jealous first of all because the nations are trying to take them away and destroy them and more so because they've left him. And that's the thing that hurts more than anything else. I've often wondered when you see a breakup of a marriage and the, the husband who's been bereft and his, his wife or maybe the other way around, uh, the wife's her husband left them and they're mad as hatter at the person that took them. I can understand that. But that would be secondary, completely and utterly secondary to me if I thought my dear wife left me. That would be the biggest hurt of all. The, the other fellow wouldn't, wouldn't even enter into my mind. That would be the biggest hurt. That's what James is telling us. And that's what Zechariah is telling us. That Yahweh is jealous for Zion with, with, with a great jealousy, brothers and sisters. He really is. And, and, and that's, it, it's a pure jealousy based upon the purity of his love. And so Zechariah goes on to tell us that, that he was jealous for, with great fury. And that was, of course, as we read in chapter 1, the, the, the nations, he was furious against the nations for the way they dealt with his people, even though he brought that nation against them, such as Assyria in Isaiah 10. He brought them. But they went beyond his commission. Oh, they wouldn't have been aware that he brought them. They wouldn't know what his commission was. But he brought them against his people to punish them for their iniquity. But they went beyond that commission. And Yahweh reacted to that very furiously. And that's what we read in that quotation from Ezekiel 38. Think of it, Ezekiel 38. That when the mighty God thinks an evil thought, Yahweh says, my fury and my jealousy will come up in my face. You're going to touch my people, dare you. There's something more here, here, brothers and sisters, than just an agreement between good and evil. There's an attachment based upon the love of the truth and the love of the people who love the truth. And that fury will rise up in his face and woe betide the nation that stands in front of him then. Well, Yahweh says in relation to that in verse 3 of chapter chapter 8, Thus saith Yahweh, I am returned Jerusalem and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Now that word dwell is in the Hebrew word sheken, which you you often hear that word used of the shekinah, glory. You often hear people say that. It's probably a bit pedantic, you know. Probably very few people understand it, so you use it to show you're clever. But you often hear that. People talk about the shekinah, glory. It just simply means the dwelling glory. So we're talking about the Shekinah glory, we're talking about God dwelling in Jerusalem. Take him out of it and there's no glory, is there? So he's coming back to Shekin, to be the Shekinah glory in the midst of that nation. And Jerusalem is going to be called a city of truth. A city of truth. Have a look at Isaiah 50. Don't lose Zechariah, keep a paper or something in there. Isaiah 59, it it, it was anything but a a, a city of truth. This is a description of what was going on in Jerusalem in Isaiah's day. Verse 13, in transgressing and lying against Yahweh, departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Judgment is turned away backward. Justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the streets and equity cannot enter. What a list. And you could just put a a caption over the top of that. 
Canberra, if you like, or any government in this world. That's how the world's run today. It is full of transgressing, lying, oppression, revolt, falsehood, turning away judgment, and justice falls in the street. It collapses in the street into dust. And the only ones who get rebuked today are the police. It's the police that are problems. They're all the big problem. They're the people going to, going, to, they're going to try and bring on trial. Is the police. Well, I'm not saying the police are altogether innocent. I'm saying there's a darn lot more guilt in this world than the, than the police is. But this is how our world's made up of. Well, says so Zechariah, Jerusalem's going to be known as city of truth. And we know the references, brethren and sisters, don't you? You know these? The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Flow? You can't flow up a mountain, can you? They can, because see, it's going to go against the natural instincts, isn't it? God's government won't pander to natural instincts, will they? He'll legislate against those things, and people will go against the flow, because they'll see that justice is here. And many people are going to say, come on, let's go to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his way. We will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. We quote that to a stranger. We want to read it for ourselves, brothers and sisters, and absorb that. That's a bit different than Isaiah 59, isn't it? At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of Yahweh, and all nations shall be gathered unto him. To the name of Yahweh to Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. And Zechariah calls it Yahweh of hosts, the holy mountain. You know, one of the Psalms talks about mountains and it says, Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. And they are, they tower. They, mountains in a, in a scenic course position are an attraction to everybody. They, they demand your attention. And you often, how many references do you see to all this? And you get things like this. Thy right mountains. And you see that one there. What a magnificent view that is. And, and you, you, you can just stand off there and just think to yourself, there he is towering above us, capped with white, the symbol, of course. A huge monument in the earth, unmovable. And in that picture, if you were standing there, you'd think, well, that glory is going to be reflected in the sea of nations, isn't it? That's just a bit of my imagination. But that's how I would see a picture like that. I think, what a wonderful thing that would be. These mountains. This one here. This is Everest. Great is Yahweh, and greatly be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Today is the anniversary of all the people that has conquered that mountain at great cost. Some lost their lives in the attempt. Some finally reach there. They could stay for about five or ten minutes. Then they've got to get out. But the mountain that, rep that of course, that, that represents the mountain of God's holiness, no man will ever reach the top. Ever, ever reach the top of that. Mountains are a fascination, aren't they? And so the, you know, the prophet Zechariah sees that that is going to be uh, the, the future. Of the, of the age we're going to live in, brothers and sisters. We're going to see Yahweh towering up, and no man's going to climb to that summit. Jesus Christ got there with his Father's help. No one else is going to get there. And God will be aloof from all, and yet he will shine upon us. He'll be reflected in the world. The Shekinah glory will be among us in the presence of his Son. It's a, it's a marvellous thing. And then in verse 4, now you imagine, as I told you last time, you try and imagine this. To these people, this, at this time of history, the temple now is under, under, in the process of being constructed. It's only a couple of years before its completion. Uh, things are on the move again. Uh, the Samaritans have been quietened down by the authorities in Persia and told to mind their business and let the Jews alone. And there's relative peace, relative peace, but it's simmering, isn't it? And these people are rubbing shoulders with them. As I said, they don't, they don't live over here and the Jews live there. They all live together. And when you went to work, you had your, eye, your eyes over your shoulder and there were whispers, and I'm quoting now Nehemiah, they were coming together and saying, hey, they're, they're everywhere, they're everywhere, they're behind us, they're going to get us. And that, that rumour was going around and Nehemiah had to squash that. And when it came to building the walls, brothers and sisters, what did he do? He, he took a man and his family and his little kids 
that he loved dearly, and he said, your house is here, is it? Yeah. He said, well, this is your part of the wall here. You leave that alone. There's a hole there, won't there? Be right in front of your door. That man would go to work, brothers and sisters. He'd, he'd work 14 hours a day to make that wall, wouldn't he? Till he fell asleep. Because that's, his, that's the, the, the safety of his, of his wife and his children. And here's Zachariah talking about the fact that, you know, old men and old women are going to be walking around the street with, with a staff like that perfectly safe. They'd think Zachariah was mad. They'd think he was crazy. <coughs> they were in mortal danger every day. When, when the builders went to build the wall, some men just stood by with spears and, and, and of course, with their, their sticks and everything and, and their swords, while the others had a trowel. Others had a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. And you got an old man and an old lady walking down the main street full of these Samaritans? Come on. It, it would be unheard of. It'd be like the Jews sending their kids for a picnic in, in, into the Gaza Strip. It's nonsense. And these people think, goodness me. And, and no wonder he kept saying, Yahweh of armies will do this. Oh, that's, oh yeah, okay. That, and they'd be assured that, well, I hope they'd be assured that if he didn't, who's going to? Well, they're not going to accomplish that. You know, old men and old ladies are going to be there. Unthinkable. Look at Jeremiah 31. Look at this. Now, what does is, what is Jeremiah 31 strike a chord in your mind, eh? Well, this, of course, is the new covenant, isn't it? Jeremiah 31, verse 31, of course, is about the new covenant. But in verses 11 and 13, it says, it says there, For Yahweh hath redeemed Jacob, in verse 11, and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he, Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of Yahweh for wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd and their soul shall be as a watered garden and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together. For I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrows. So you see, it's going to happen. But you see the basis of it? The new covenant in Jeremiah 31. Not like I made with your fathers in Horeb, he said. Not like the law. This is different. What's the difference? The one massive difference is Jesus Christ. That's the difference. The Lord came. He shed his blood, brothers and sisters, in our nature. Took it all on himself as our representative to prove to us all that mortality is not only right but all that it brings old age when all your ailments come if it's not your ears it's your eyes if it's not them it's your teeth if it's not them it's something else and so on and so on he died to show us that God is right that that's what should have happened and he stood alone in that and he did that and never simply not once did he sin Never did he give in to that nature. That's what the new covenant is about. And that's going to put old men and old women and children in the streets of Jerusalem in perfect safety. That's what it's all about. That's why that quotation is in Jeremiah chapter 31. Now verse 6 of the 8th of, of Zechariah says this. See, verse 5 says, The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. And that, that would have been impossible to think about. For thus saith Yahweh of armies. Again, we get that statement. If it be marvellous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it be marvellous in my eyes, saith Yahweh of armies? That word marvellous means difficult. You see, a thing that's marvellous is difficult, isn't it? But it's, it's wrongly translated. Most, nearly all the other reliable translations would, would render it too hard or difficult. So Yahweh says, that's too hard to imagine. Imagine the Jew in those days thinking, oh, yeah, OK, I, yeah, but I, 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 I can't see that. I can't, I can't believe that. Yahweh says, you think it's hard, do you? Well, yeah, I do. Well, Yahweh says, do you reckon that's too hard for me? And you know, brother, I'm like that. I'm very much like that. As I say, my imagination does me good and bad. I get to a point in my imagination when I try and make a reality of, of immortality and having a, an attitude of mind that's 
like Jesus Christ, not just physically perfect, but having an attitude built into me that's completely and utterly taken out of me every sense of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and the pride of life. I can't imagine that. You know, he says, you think it's too hard? I've got to say something I'm here, I do. I, I think about my loved ones who I, I sometimes think about passing of those we loved many years ago, but my relations that are dying in their grave and they're just bones, probably less than that, some of them. He always says, you reckon that's too hard for me? And my heart, my natural man says, yeah, I, I, I reckon it's hard. And I mean that. You, 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 if you're not careful, you, you could imagine yourself out of the truth if, if you don't keep that in mind. But Yahweh says, you know who I am? I am Yahweh of armies. And he hasn't got one and two in his army. He only needs one or two. He's got thousands upon thousands of them. And he only needs one or two. And when the great prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ being born of a virgin, who's going to believe that? Could you believe that? Well, you do believe it. Of course you do. It's in our statement of faith. But you think about that. This woman's never known a man. And she's going to have a child. And Isaiah says, unto us a child is given. Unto us a child is born. And unto us a son is given. So he was our child. He wasn't our son. He was our child because he was born of a woman. But he was not our son. Unto, a, unto us a child is born. But unto us the son is given. What's it got to do with this? You know what the next verse says? The zeal of Yahweh of armies will do this. That's your answer. And you've got to forget about the mechanism of nature and the natural processes. You've got to forget about that. And you have to believe the impossible. And you know, brothers and sisters, when that message was sung on the hills of Judea at the birth of our Lord, think of this. When that message was sung and the shepherds were out there in the field and that was announced, there appeared to the shepherds one angel, one. And he said, unto you is born this day in the city of David a saviour, which is Christ the Lord. That's Luke 2 verse 20. One angel said that. Unto you is born, unto us a child is given. Unto you is born this day in the city of David. He's a human being which is Christ the Lord. You know what the next verse says? And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts saying, Glory to God in highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Just imagine what that scene was doing. I, I, I believe this is exactly what it was doing. So the shepherds, humble shepherds out there, did they understand the things of nature? You know, the breeding of their sheep, the birth of the little lambs, they saw all those processes, they knew about human nature, they all knew that by experimentally, and here we're being told by this one angel that we're going to have a child, and, and somehow or other it's going to be miraculous, it's going to be in the city of David, and he's, he's going to be called Christ the Lord, and when we can't believe it, and all of a sudden the heaven is full of this army saying, we're here, the zeal of, the, of Yahweh of armies will perform that, Oh, wow. And they ran away, didn't they? To tell the good news, brothers and sisters, because they know that invisible for a moment, but now visible to them, the whole heaven, the, the, the 12 legions up there, as Jesus called them, were up there to do nothing else but make sure that happened. Just think of that. Is it too hard for me? And you know where that expression is used, brothers and sisters? It, it's used of the birth of Isaac. You know about the birth of Isaac? They waited 25 years, Abraham and Sarah, after they'd come into the land. The boy didn't come for all those years. And dear old Sarah passed on, of course, and on and on into old age. It got to the stage, of course, where her natural processes dried up. She was, of course, beyond the stage of having children. It was impossible. Paul says that Abraham considered his own body now dead when it really wasn't because he produced children later on through Keturah. But the next sentence says, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. And her, her womb was stone dead. And Yahweh said to them when she laughed, 
Is anything too hard for Yahweh? Same word as here, marvellous. Is that too hard for me? And lo and behold, the boy was born. Oh yes, it came naturally. Union between a man and a woman, but unnaturally because the woman was way beyond. Way beyond that stage where her natural body couldn't even feed that child, unborn child. But it, it did. Don't ask any physician today how it happened. Don't ask them. They won't know, brothers and sisters. They've got no explanation any more than we have. But it happened. It, you, you've got this same statement used in Jeremiah. When Jeremiah painted a, a, a tremendous vision of the heavens and the earth and talked about the fact that as sure as those heavens, as the sun rose in the morning and the moon in the evening and the seasons come and go and went, changing as they went, as sure as those things, he said, so God's promises would be fulfilled. And he says, is that too hard to understand? With all what's going on in the world today, is it hard to understand us, for us to understand, brothers and sisters, that Israel will be in the land and in the middle of Israel will be the Lord Jesus Christ and there'll be a border around that land and nobody will be in there except Israel and who they let in. Can you imagine that now in Jerusalem today? That the world having that attitude to them? Is that too hard to believe? Well, Zechariah keeps telling us, you know who's going to do that? Yahweh of armies is going to do that. So it's going to happen. We've got to believe it, brothers and sisters. Now verse 7 says this. Thus saith Yahweh of armies, again we get it, Behold, I will save my people, that's interesting, from the east country and the west country. Now think of it. You've seen a map of Israel, haven't you? If you open up a map of Israel, there it's standing there, and you know instinctively that you look towards Galilee, that's north, and you look down here to the Dead Sea and the Arabah, and that's south. So we're going to talk about, and the little Israel's such a, na a, a narrow strip, you can forget east and west. So you talk about Israel, you're talking about north and south. But Yahweh says, I'm going to bring my people from the east, and that's the the plateau of Moab and the desert of Arabia and the west is the sea. You see the point he's making? And you know, where is that used? You see, it, the phrase goes like this, brothers and sisters. Put Rotherham and most other translations do the same. He says, they will come from the land of the dawn and the land of the going down of the sun. My people. So it's not like that. Israel straight up and down, it's over this way. Desert there, sea here. That's where they're going to come from. Now look at these references. The mighty God, even Yahweh, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun, the going down of the sun. Isn't that interesting? For from the rising of the sun, even of the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered under my name and a pure offering. For in my name shall be great among the heathen, saith Yahweh of armies. As Rotherham says, from the land of the dawn and the land of the rising sun, from the east and the west. Jesus Christ, that he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence you are. He's talking to the, um, the disobedient Pharisees and scribes and the Jewish people. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out and they shall come from the east and from the west, yes, and from the north and the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. Now they would only think that only come from the north and the south. No, the east and the west. Jesus says, and you're going to be thrown out, but there'll be others there that came outside your geographical boundaries. That's what that's saying, brothers and sisters. That is what that is saying in Zechariah. And then, of course, he says this, and we'll finish pretty soon, in verse 7 again, in verse 8 rather, and I will bring them, notice this, he says, I will bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and they shall be my people. Well, wasn't Israel his, already his people? They were, weren't they? 
But now we're getting told about they coming from the east or the rising of the sun to the dawning of the, of the, the, dawning of the day rather than the, and, the, and the setting of the sun. They're going to come from those extremities and they're my people. But Israel thought, now your people are here. They're not there. But notice God says they come in all directions. But here, especially those two directions, because this is what's going to change everything, isn't it? This chapter's about change. It opened up by telling us that Jerusalem's going to be, or chapter 2, verse, the second verse says, a city of truth. So it's all going to change. Well, everything's going to change, because God's going to do this. It's going to be an ex, ex, extraordinary work, brothers and sisters, an extraordinary thing. So we're going to see extraordinary things. And Israel couldn't believe these things. But God said, I'm going to do this. And they're going to be called my people. And they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, he says. They will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. That's why Jerusalem is used as a synonym for his people. It's used as a metonymy of his people because Jerusalem is his people. We're told that we're going to have the, the name of our God written upon us and the name of the city of our God because we're going to be citizens of the, of the polity of, of Jerusalem, aren't we? So it, it's going to be a, a, a metonym to, to describe the people. We're told in, in Isaiah that we're going to be written among the living in Jerusalem. And they're not just simply Jews. They're people from the four points of the compass. And then we're told, brothers and sisters, they're going to be called my people. Well, that's not the first time that was said, was it? The changed status for Israel. Hosea said that they'd be rejected as God's people. But he says later on, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. There'll be a, a ter tremendous change of status only for Israel. See, they thought they were God's people. Yes, they are in the sense, and in another sense they're not. Because of their, of, of their character, their characteristics proved they were not his people in that characteristic sense. But in the sense of the promises of their forefathers, they were always his people. But now they're going to be his real people. They're going to really be changed, aren't they? Look what Paul does with that quote. A changed status for Israel and the Gentiles. Here's Paul's quotation of that verse. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Well, we just say that, as he saith in Hosea. My people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass, where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there they shall be called the children of the living God. Now, how come can Paul use a reference like that when the reference itself was clearly to Israel? Well, brothers and sisters, Paul's showing that God's selection is not about nationality. So if you've that you call today my people, and say it's Israel, right? It's my people. Now, they're disobedient. They're a disgrace to the calling. So God says, you are not my people. So over here, they are now says Hosea, the day will come when you take them back. So he brings them back. So those people who are not his people now become his people. If he can do that with one group of people, why can't he do it with every group of people? If while they were here, they might have been called Israel, and they were his people, but God put them over there, they're on the same status as Gentile people. They're no different. They're just as estranged from God, more so because they had knowledge. They're more than estranged from God than the Gentiles were. If he can take them from there to put them there, Paul says, he can take anyone from anywhere and put them there. That's the principle. It's not on the base of what their blood is. It's their status in the sight of God is what their spirit is. And so Paul says, hey, that just doesn't apply, he said, uh, to, the, to the Jews. That principle is a universal principle because it's not based upon nationality. It's got nothing to do with that at all. And that's why the Apostle is able to show us what Zechariah said, they shall be called my people. And then finally, verse 8, because that's where our division finishes, we can finish tonight. It says in there that, and I will be their God in truth, 
and righteousness. Let's have a look, just to have a look at Isaiah 26, just to have a look at that. So he's going to be their God, first of all in truth and righteousness. Now we won't turn the other reference up in, in relation to this one in Isaiah, but just let me tell you this. Isaiah was a prophet who was contemporary with Hezekiah, okay? When Hezekiah called his Passover and he invited all Israel, north and south, to his Passover, it says that when they came together, there was things that were done not according to the law, but the good Yahweh winked at that because it was impossible under the circumstances to change it. People weren't doing, you think, evil, but they weren't keeping the law or the letter of it. But he says, don't worry, Hezekiah, it's, it's the spirit that counts. So he got his people together and they offered a burnt offering upon the altar, which were total dedication to God. Head, fat, flesh. With all your heart and soul. With all, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And, the, and that was consumed as a total dedication to God. And it says, all the time that the burnt offering burnt, the priest sang the song of Yahweh. What was that? They sang the song of Yahweh, it says. Now, we don't know from Chronicles, chapter 29, Second Chronicles 29, what the song was. We, here it's here. Here's the prophet that was there. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. Won't be sung anywhere else. It's only going to be sung in one place. And the song is, we have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in, in truth and righteousness. Now they couldn't sing that in Samaria, could they? They couldn't sing that in Bethel. Because it wasn't being done up there, was it? It's got to be sung here, in this place. So Isaiah says, we have a strong city where this song's going to be sung but we're not going to ban anybody. Let the gates be wide open and let everybody come in that keeps the truth in righteousness. This is what Jerusalem's going to be. What does that mean, brothers and sisters? It means this, that in the future age we're going to have this principle. Why can't we do that today? Why do ecclesias have to do something different than that? I believe that we should stand here as an ecclesia that if anyone comes in that door and wants fellowship with us, they are welcome, providing it's on the basis of truth and righteousness. And we will show compassion and mercy will be limitless once that's acknowledged. But no, we get people today calling the very text of the Bible in question. Text which couldn't be plainer, could not be plainer about the role of our sisters, about creation versus evolution. You couldn't have it plainer. But we've got to be merciful. Because these people, well, you know, they really believe in God. Brothers and sisters, that's not what that's saying. Now let me tell you something else. You think about this principle. We come here every Sunday morning to partake of the emblems. I want to make this strong appeal to our ecclesia. We do not compromise, brothers and sisters, nor do we become hard-hearted, nor do we become insensitive to people. We love our brothers and sisters. We do anything for them, providing it's done God's way. Now, think about this. You look at that bread and wine. What's it talking about on the Sunday morning? It's about your Lord and my Lord's sacrifice. And all the arguments in the world are made about that sacrifice as to what it really means. An emphasis is put on it this way or that way. And you get an emphasis when people say, he died for himself. Well, he didn't. He died for us. But he was involved. Yes, we agree. He, involved. he was involved. And he benefited from his own offering. Yes, he did. He died for us. He certainly did. But brethren and sisters, before ever, he benefited from his own death. And before ever, he died for us. He died for his father. First and foremost, he was up there to declare God's righteousness. 
If we don't put that first, brothers and sisters, you'll never ever have anything else but spiritual disaster in your meeting. Believe me. That's got to be number one. It doesn't mean we become insensitive to people. It doesn't mean we become hard-hearted. It doesn't mean we turn our back on people. But it means we will do what we can for anyone as God has done for us as long as truth and righteousness are the strength of that city. The gates are open. But they're not open if they're not. That's the issue. And that's how Zechariah says God will do it. Jerusalem will cut a city of truth. That's why people come into it. And they gotta, when they come into it, they don't come in there as Hindus or Buddhists or Shiites or Sunnis or something else. They come into it because they are the Israel of God who were not God's people, but now they are. And that, brothers and sisters, is the principle, I believe, that we're learning in those first eight verses of Zechariah.